Okay. EIP 4044. Um, let me start with a quick introduction. So I'm Mofi, um, also known as Adinfi at Discord, Telegram. Um, I work for OP Labs, which is the engineering arm of uh, Optimism. And basically here to tell you about the future of uh, rollups. So what's this talk about? Um, we're going to go over the concept of data availability, modular blockchains, EIP 4404, of course, and how that fits into dank sharding. And um, give you a little quick update on uh, what the status of EIP 4404 development is currently. So data availability, this is um, kind of like the problem of having data in your network and making that data like available to users in the sense that um, once you post that data, you should be able to like trust that the data will exist and be around the network for some amount of time. Um, this is actually like related, super related to rollups because one of the main bottleneck of rollups is the data that we post back to L1. And right now we use call data for that, which is expensive. But if we can solve this problem, scale out the data we're posting back to L1 really cheaply, then the scaling of rollups will follow as well. So that availability is also related to the execution in the sense that this data that we're posting back to L1, um, for the perspective of a rollup, we consume that data to derive the chain, right? And so the execution outputs are also like an L2 concern. So a rollup in a nutshell is the data and the execution check. It doesn't matter what kind of rollup it is, whether it's optimistic or ZK rollups, you can pretty much like break it down into these two key um, intrinsic properties. So for the data availability, like I mentioned, the data that you're posting back to L1, you need to be able to derive it. You need to be able to consume that data to derive the uh, rollup chain. The execution check is the process of actually like um, checking that the data that was posted matches what you expect for the rollup. And so in the case of like a ZK rollup, it's just a validity proof. For an optimistic rollup, it's a fault proof or fraud proof. <laughs> so for data availability, you can, I guess you could sort of like think about it like data forever available or data once available. Whereas in the former case, um, the data you're posting back to L1, it needs to be always there or easily reconstructed and trusted uh, forever. And I will show like, I'll basically tell you how we able to accomplish this with uh, EIP 4404. For data once available, um, this is like the minimum requirement for most rollups, whereby they have like a settlement period, at least for optimistic rollups, whether it's like two weeks or whatever. If the data is available for longer than that settlement period, then you, you basically can trust the rollup because you can always derive the state from the data. And this ties back to the execution check I mentioned. Um, the data, the point of that data is so that we can challenge um, any bad sequencer, which is the entity that's like um, building a rollup chain and posting it back to L1. So let's do a quick segue into uh, modular blockchains. Um, so Ethereum is actually has become quite modular, particularly um, since the merge that's just happened. And why is this useful? Well, it lets us pretty much um, encapsulate um, feature sets and complexity into one thing that's easy to reason about and then keep things completely separate so that we can scale one thing without like possibly introducing complex complexity in another thing. So it's a way to like deal with cyclochromatic uh, complexity overall. So let's go over like the sort of like future designs of like scaling in Ethereum today. Um, we have like an L1, which is like a mon monolithic chain. And then sometime a couple years ago, we had like the beacon chain, 
which, as you've noticed, it's quite a modular addition to the existing execution chain. So we have like the EVM, right? And um, before we had like the proof of work, which was used to like secure all state transitions in the EVM. But then with the merge, we introduced like the concept of like a beacon node. And what that does is decouple the um, proof of work aspect of the um, execution and let that be handled by the beacon node. So all the beacon node needs to do is like interact with like the execution chain, the EVM, to um, determine which blocks needs to be proposed and built. So again, this is reiterating really the point. We introduced the proof of stake um, on top of the EVM. And this was, I say it's easy, but it took a lot of engineering years to do this, but it's easy to reason about because all the stuff that we built on the proof of stake chain, the beacon chain, um, does not really affect the EVM that much. All the proof of stake is just proposing like um, blocks, right? And asking the EVM to build it. So it's, a, it's an example of like a clean modular architecture. We can expand the EVM if we need to. We can scale it without affecting the proof of stake and vice versa. Okay, so for, how does this look like um, for an L2? That concept of like modularity is also pretty useful because um, you have like an L1 execution engine and in an L2 rollup, Optimism, ZK Sync or whatever, it's basically just interacting with the L1 chain to figure out how to derive the L2 chain, right? And then once it's done with that derivation, it just posts back um, all the transactions that occur on the L2 chain back to L1. And so like, there's this, like, this cycle where transactions are like consumed from L1, um, they get moved to the next state on L2, and then we post it back to L1. So this is kind of like how it fits in L2s today. You have like the proof of stake at the very top, the EVM, and then L2s, they don't really need to interact with the proof of stake, right? Because we've already made things modular enough that all an L2 needs are the uh, state that the EVM exposes, right? So you have multiple L2s interacting with the same L1 EVM. And again, we can verify execution between the EVM and L2 via either fault proof or the validity proof, the execution check that I mentioned. Okay, so how does this look like in like other blockchains, like uh, Solana or Avalanche? Well, they introduced the concept of a data layer. And what this layer does is, um, it provides like a common interface for bytes data, if you want to call it that, that several different subchains could share. And it's, it looks nice at first because solving for data is pretty important for scalability. But the problem with this is that now that you don't, you have, you have to break up execution into different subchains and you lose some security when you do it that way. Ideally, we want to have like the EVM and the data being handled by L1. Even though we do it modular, it, it doesn't matter. But if we can have our cake and eat it, then everyone will be smiling, right? So we sort of solve this problem of like bundling data and execution on the same chain via EIP 4444. Um, it's also called proto dank sharding because uh, it was like being spec'd out by Proto Lambda, also another um, guy from OP Labs, and Dan Card from the EF. So you combine them, you get Proto Dank sharding. Not very uh, creative, is it? <laughs> so EIP 4404, um, what does it entail as well? We need a KCG ceremony. It's a hard requirement to, for EIP 4404 to work. We need new BLS libraries to implement new KCG crypto. Cryptography, I'll explain what KCG is in a moment. Um, we have a development um, DevNet that's running, implementing a prototype of EIP 4404. And we also have a consensus specs. So this is actually like the first time, okay, maybe the merge is one of the time, but first time post-merge where by an EIP um, 
really um, has like a dependency on consensus and vice versa. So with EIP 4404, um, this is sort of how like the picture of a modular, ideal modular blockchain could look like, right? We have like the L1 EVM, which we all trust and it's secure. We provide, we add a data layer, right? Um, some people call it, dub it the uh, byte space or blob space. Um, and what this gives you is the security of the execution and the assurance that the data that's available on L1 um, is not like, um, is as expected and can be used to reconstruct the state. So L2s, how would L2s use this? All L2s needs to do is basically attach to the data layer whenever we're posting back um, L2 outputs. Because if you remember, if we go back a couple slides here, um, when a sequencer um, derives um, the chain from L1 and then applies more transactions in L2, that data that's posted back to L1, it doesn't have to be like L1 call data. It can be any L1 call M data provider. So what we're doing here is replacing the call data that was in the EVM with a new layer. And the, the idea is that this would make things so much cheaper for LTs. Okay, so the data that we're posting, we refer to it as a blob, right? And this is just, think of it as like call data. It doesn't really matter what it is. Um, this blob, kind of like, um, it goes to like a life cycle that this uh, slide kind of summarizes. So the L2 transaction um, that an, a user um, posts, well, a user like, as a user that interacts with L2 like Optimism, it generates a transaction. Um, at a certain period, an L2 sequencer or a roll-up operator will bundle up several of these transactions and then we post these transactions to L1, right? Previously, well, today, we post these transactions as call data. The ideal is that we post these transactions as a blob. And the way we do this is by introducing a new type of transaction called a blob transaction, similar to the way we introduced the um, dynamic fee transaction for EAP1559. There would also be a new blob transaction for 4844. This transaction, it looks like a regular um, ETH1 transaction, um, EVM transaction, but it also adds like additional data that lets you post um, L2 batch data, the bundle, um, separate from the call data. And due to like pricing mechanics, it can be really cheaply to do so. Okay, so this blob data eventually ends up in the beacon chain. It's important to note that the uh, EVM does not store blob data. This is, the storage is actually being handled by the beacon chain. So going back here, the slide's kind of misleading because these blobs are sort of like part of consensus, but it's easier to reason them as like a different data layer for various reasons that I'll get into. And then from the perspective of an L2, if we need to derive the chain, all we need to do is find a beacon client, retrieve the data that we just posted, and then we can just derive the chain that way, right? So this is another diagram that sort of like shows the whole workflow. Um, basically the same thing as you said, you have like an L2 sequencer, takes transactions, rolls them up into a roll up, post, that, uh, post um, batch data into an L1, the L1 takes those transactions as it's building a beacon block, provides those transactions to the beacon chain. Um, the beacon chain, it gets proposed, the data gets gossiped throughout the network, and then an, an L2 verify can take that data and derive the chain to get the, to the exact same state that we had. Okay, so go into some details about what a blob transaction is. Like I mentioned, it's similar to an EIP-1559 transaction. Um, actually, the pricing mechanics is very similar. Like um, the way EIP-1559 floats with the base fee, um, it's also similar here. Took some inspiration there. And the important thing to note is that the blobs, right, they're completely separate from the actual transaction body. And the way we're able to do this 
is that um, a blob transaction sort of like has two variants, right? When it's in the mempool, it contains all the blob data, but when, once it gets included into a block and it's part of the state tree, um, we sort of like strip off that blob data and make it available to the beacon chain. Because like I said, the EVM does not store blob data. It's, that storage happens in the beacon chain. So it basically looks like an old um, dynamic fee transaction, but we add a couple new fields. One thing we add is uh, the blob KCGs. Um, KCGs in general, what they are, they're basically um, a commitment to a piece of data. So think of it as like marker proofs, except that the proofs, the commitments, are very succinct. KCGs are always 48 bytes in size, no matter how large the data is, which is pretty important property to have because this blob KCG is going to be part of the beacon block, and we need to be able to easily distribute that data without having really large proofs. KCG commitments also let you prove um, the valuation of a single point. So say you have like the blob data and you want to know, um, you want to prove that blob data at a certain index has a different byte pattern. Well, you can easily do that using blob KCGs as well. Again, it's very similar to the way like marker proofs work. And um, one last thing, we added a new field to the transaction called the blob version hash. What it, this is is just a hash of the KCG commitments. Um, the reason why we're using a hash is because it makes it easier for us to, um, ex to like, it's for future compatibility, basically. If we decide to use a different commitment scheme, then um, we would just change the way the hash schema works and a different hash would like can be used there. All right. Oh, and one last thing. So a blob is basically a, it's, it's a set of 40, 98 field elements. And these field elements are basically just points on a BLS curve, in particular for this EIP, BLS 381.12, um, which means the total size of a blob is 128 kilobytes. So with a single um, blob transaction, you can store 128 kilobytes that's completely separate from call data and it does not get added to the EVM, but only exists in the beacon chain. One more thing worth pointing out is that um, since blob data is separate from call data, we need a way to price it, and the fee market structure we came up with is introducing a new type of gas called data gas, or blob gas, but blob gas, data gas, doesn't matter. And this data gas behaves regularly similar to regular gas. And the semantics is very similar to 1559 in the sense that um, we have a fixed target for data gas for the entire block. And if we notice that we're exceeding that target, then the gas price fee, the data gas fees go up. And if we're below the target, it goes down. The entire point is, is just a control system to keep data gas at a certain level so that we don't overburden the network with like huge blobs. To accommodate this, we added a new field to the uh, block header in execution. Um, we call it the excess data gas fee. Honestly, this approach is something we also could have adopted for EIP 1559, um, but maybe in some future upgrade, we could also do the same thing. This field makes it easier to, makes it easy to compute how much we are off of target for the data gas and uh, for various reasons, it's also very nice to like implement rather than the way EIP-1559 works uh, with the base fee. So again, there's no blob content in the EVM. All the blobs are stored in the beacon chain. Um, so this is kind of like how it looks like um, you wrap like a regular transaction, version hash, that wrap data is the blobs but that only exists in the EVM while it's in the mempool, but it's not included in the beacon block. Okay, so how does the beacon chain interact with this blob 
transactions or new header, whatever. The way we kind of like have it set right now is to introduce a new execution, and, and sorry, engine API. Um, so if, the way the engine API works right now is you can propose um, be, um, execution blocks to the EVM, and then you can update for choice. Um, what we're doing is adding a new function that lets you um, get the payload in addition to like getting the the blobs bundle. So what does this look like? So remember, like if you go through the whole process of like a, a validator proposal, right? It needs to make a request to the EVM to get the blocks that it built, and then it adds those blocks to the uh, beacon chain, well, the headers to the beacon chain. So similarly, we need to make a request to the EVM, the execution, to get the sidecar, or the blobs. Those blobs are packaged into this new data structure called a sidecar. A sidecar is just a collection of blocks, and for various reasons, we don't want to add that to the beacon I'm sorry, to so the execution header, because it will bloat the header more than it already is. Okay, so how does a rollup take advantage of all of this? Right, that's the entire point of this, right? So first of all, for a ZK rollup, and they might bear in mind this is a very simplified model of a ZK rollup. All a ZK rollup needs during its execution in, in the, the settlement in L1, it needs to figure out the data that it has containing all that state. Um, it needs to be confident that the data is what it says it is. And the way it does that is by querying the EVM, given a blob index, a KCG point proof, and um, some other ZK related proofs, get the actual like version hash that's associated with that blob index, and then we can use that version hash and be confident that the blob data we, that we provided to the um, contract is correct and it's not being spoofed or anything of the sort. There's one tricky thing about with ZK rollups is that um, they may be using a different commitment scheme um, other than KCGs. They may be using IPAs or whatever, but there exists a morphism between um, any given ZK um, commitment scheme and a KCG commitment scheme. And that morphism is basically um, the proof of equivalence. So with a proof of equivalence, you can take the KCGs and do some crazy crypto magic. Honestly, I don't completely understand this part. But with that, you can be confident that the whatever commitment scheme you're using for your ZK rollup will be compatible with the uh, KCG commitments that are L1. And so if we go through here, we added a new opcode called, called the point evaluation query compile. What that does is takes the version hash that we just, we just um, retrieved, um, it points on the blob what its value should be and the proof, right? And the opcode will basically, in the EVM, check that the point that you requested matches the value that you expect. And this is a way to check Right, do, doing your validity proof that um, a user that's posting data for the proof is not um, like forging like blob data. This is all relying on the security of L1 KCG commitments. So again, this is going forward again. Um, proof is the same as the ZK data. We, um, we use the precompile, we check. We can check like multiple points in our blobs, and then for every point that we need during the validity proof, we just use the precompile, check that it evaluates the right value, and then go forward from there. Okay, so for interactive fraud proofs, how does it look like? It's uh, quite different. Um, you have like a pre-image oracle, so again, this is like with the um, perspective of a fault proof, whereby you do this bisection game, a dispute game, whereby um, there's a contract and you have like a challenger and someone disputes data, the challenger disputes data that was posted on L1, so it needs to interact with this contract to figure out um, whether the data, the dispute is, has any merit or not. And so here, the pure image oracle 
doesn't actually know um, what the blob data should be. All it has access to are the version hashes, which ergo are tied to the KCG commitments. So as a challenger, your job is to provide that blob data, right? And the interactive, um, the free image oracle can just check via L1 that the blob data is correct. If I do the if point evaluation precompile, similar to the ZK rollups case, and trust that the blob data you provided is correct, and then it can do the state transition itself to verify the proof. And the update VM memory, this is in the case of like what Vitalik was mentioning earlier, whereby um, you run your state transition inside of a, like an, another virtual machine, whether it's MIPS, but you can kind of like ignore that for the purpose of the interactive proof. The main point of this is that you're providing data to the pre-image oracle. It knows that it can trust the data using L1, and then it can do the state transition from there. Okay, so dank sharding. EIP444 is sort of like a precursor to um, dank sharding, hence the name proto-dank sharding, um, in the sense that for full dank sharding, and to recap, like dank sharding is the, is, um, the long-term solution for Ethereum data availability and data scaling in Ethereum. But one thing we definitely need before we even implement this full dank sharding is the ability to post data back to the beacon chain. And so that's what EIP-404 does if you have blob transactions. Um, by introducing blobs, we can build the necessary um, requirements for full data availability. Actually, for this EIP, data availability sampling is not quite implemented. We just make the data available, so it's not quite as efficient as full dank sharding, but we'll get there. And the idea is that we introduce um, blob space of like one megabytes per second. Actually, that should be per slot, not per second, unless this S refers to slot. So every slot, we introduce one megabyte, and um, that megabyte, that blob data is basically what rollups would use to um, post all their data. So once we do this, for full dank sharding, we don't need to touch EDEVM anymore. Like, we're done. All the changes necessary for full dank sharding would occur in the beacon chain. So this is kind of like how the, it would look like with full dank sharding. Um, you have like the EVM with multiple data shards, and L2s can just plug into any one of these data shards to like get the data they need to uh, derive the chain. Okay, so where are we at with the development of this? So we've been hard of work like for almost a year now, just trying to get EIP 4844 into fruition. And that entails like building prototypes, um, doing workshops, like updating the specs, making optimizations, and building dev nets, as a matter of fact. So this all started like super early this year at Denver. Proto, Lambda, another like OP engineer, Labs engineer was uh, working on this with the EF. There was like an original prototype. And then this summer, we really started ramping up development on EIP 444. Um, and by Berlin, we had our first DevNet. Um, the DevNet had like a very simplified fee model structure, but it sort of like demonstrated that EIP 444 is feasible and client teams should definitely look at it. Well, and now today at DEF CON Bogota, we have a new DevNet coming up. Um, this DevNet will implement the full fee market spec and all the other consensus layer changes we've made since then. So this is sort of like a summary of all the work that's gone into like EIP 404 implementation wise. Um, we have like new specs, um, execution specs. We have a geth prototype. We have a prison prototype. Um, shout out to Coinbase for actually helping us with this. This is a collaborative effort between OP Labs and Coinbase to like build clients that are compliant with EIP 404. Um, we have new execution API specs, though that's kind of like stale right now. And the KCG ceremony. So let me quickly go over the KCG ceremony. 
for EIP 444 to work, we need what is called like a trusted setup. And what a trusted setup is, is basically a way for multiple participants to derive a value that is like a secret and can be used for KCG crypto. The idea is that no one knows what the secret is as long as the tr trusted setup was like uh, um, executed correctly. Um, there's a team in EF that's hard at work on the KCG ceremony, but hopefully by the time we ship EIP 444, KCG ceremony is done and um, we can proceed from there. All right, so what's left to build? First is like a proof of concept that a rollup can take advantage of EIP 4044 and observe that you know, we are actually saving a lot of gas um, using um, blob transactions rather than using call data. So for optimism, in, in this case, it's actually kind of like easy. The bedrock architecture, which is like the next upgrade for optimism, it's a very modular architecture whereby um, all the steps to derive a chain are completely partitioned. So all we need for EIP 444 is to replace where we get L1 data, which is currently today the call data, to just use the data, data availability layer. And this is sort of like another block diagram that summarizes how that would look like. Again, with the L2 node, um, Rather than interacting with L1 to get that call data needed to derive the chain, it interacts with the beacon node right at the very top. So that sequence of data just gets fed into the rollup node, and then we can um, end up with the same state. So the DevNet, um, we've been doing a lot of benchmarking for the DevNet, making sure that the EIP 4444 does not introduce any new um, DOS vectors or issues. And we've been getting pretty confident at that. There are still a couple of open issues regarding like how do we sync blob data in the beacon chain that we're currently looking into. Um, and of course, last thing is once the KCG ceremony is done, how do we integrate that into um, EIP 444 in the sense that how do execution clients, beacon chain clients, take advantage of the ceremony output. All right, so what implementations do we have? Like I mentioned, we have like a ready prototype for GEF and PRISM. Um, for Nethermind, they have interest in implementing EIP 444. They have an issue open on the repo. Teku, they also have like a lot of interest in it. For Lighthouse, they've already begun work on a prototype. Um, still work in progress though. Um, I think it was like at ETH um, Berlin, um, some folks in Lighthouse, including like a Geth core dev, started working on a prototype and they're getting there. So for EIP 404, the best resource really to learn more about it is the website, um, EIP444.com. Um, there's also a HackMD written by Proto Lambda that summarizes all the different spec changes we've made over the years. Because right now, it's kind of hard to follow the EIP 444 development because we have the execution layer specs, we have the um, consensus layer specs, and those are not always in sync. So this meta link in HackMD should really help you like, um, figure out where the current status of the specification is. And yeah, that's it. Any uh, questions? Yeah. Sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, hello. I know the blobs get deleted after one month, but can you always prove the KCG commitments in an Ethereum transaction using that opcode past one month has been? Yeah, so like I mentioned, the, even the opcode doesn't, doesn't access the blobs. You have to feed it the blobs. And the KCG commitments via the version hash are in the EVM, even way past the one month period. 
So you can always prove it. One possible idea that you could see in the future is that um, we could have like someone create like a bit torrent of all the blob transactions that are older like than a month, and then you can still provide that to the EVM to verify that they are correct. Yeah, go ahead. I'm I'm curious how you see that after this proposal has been implemented, passed. Like, how does it affect other data availability solutions out there that are like no settlement, just DA? Yeah, um, I think it reduces their use cases by a lot because prior to EIP four four four, there was talks about rollups taking advantage of them and re-implementing actually a lot of the KCG commitment stuff as a smart contract. But if we can enshrine that in L1, we don't really need all of that. But they would still be useful, like in the BitTorrent case, whereby they would provide long-term access to blob data. And there could be some applications, maybe NFTs with like uh, IPFS hashes or something that might find it useful to like have a commitment in L1 that they can always use to reference long-term blob data. Thank you so much, Mofi. Give it up for Mofi. Well done.